I don't know if I'm ready today, right? I have this overwhelming anxiety of not saying the right thing and not being what everybody needs me to be at all times. But I've also realized that I have done my education enough. I know my family enough. I know my own history enough. And that should be enough for coming to talk with my girlfriend about things that mean a lot to both of us. This is my friend Isabella Khair Hadid. You may know her as Bella Hadid, the half-Dutch, half-Palestinian supermodel, co-founder of the drink brand Kin Euphorics, and a passionate advocate for the Palestinian people. We are in her New York City apartment, curled up on a couch. Our current soundtrack is the soft hum of rush hour traffic. At the moment, we're having a conversation Bella has never had publicly before. I think for so many years, I was pushed to like do interviews and do things when I genuinely didn't know who I was or what my favorite color was or what I liked to eat on a Thursday night because I was focused on different things like work and work and work and work. But now I realize that I still have this lingering anxiety of feeling not good enough, whether or not I say all of the right things or constantly do the right thing. I know that this is my truth. And I know that regardless which way I say it or how I put it, it's still going to be my truth. My intention is that my truth can possibly mirror somebody else's truth. That gives them the opportunity to look deeper within themselves. When I was 14, I wrote Free Palestine on my hand, literally with flowers in paint on my hand. And I was being called names and being immediately blasted as a person of hatred for another people. But all I was talking about was freeing my father's people, my people who are deeply hurting at the moment. And not only that, like we're witnessing their pain. We're witnessing it happen. And still I can't speak about it. Okay, so that was like the start of me attempting to be vocal about the Palestinian cause. I had my friend's parents tell me that my dad was a liar and where he's been telling me he was from is fake and not true. And so growing up with that, you lose like who you are because you don't know who you are because everyone tells you who you are is not true. And so I think that's a lot of where my imposter syndrome of who I am. For Bella, being told who she was began in middle school. I was called a terrorist by the head of the football team. So from that point on, in, in like an eighth grade, and you're just like, is it because of my dad's name or is it because of where my family comes from or is it because of me and the way that I look? It's like at that point, you almost like lose confidence in who you are and you're like, oh, well, maybe they are right. I never understood why I was in this position in my life. Then I just like am trying to figure out what my place on this planet is because I know that it's bigger than just like living in this body. But I never knew who Bella actually was until I reconnected with my Palestinian side to my family where I felt this like depth of passion and pain through stories and through being able to sit in your truth and speak your truth. You're almost in some ways healing generational trauma. Asking my dad for the first time about stories, you know, my cousin Lena, like her telling me about all of the sisters and my dad and how when they left Palestine and when they arrived in Syria and like, you know, just about their first initial movements after they were removed from their homes, that's when this red light came on and I was like, oh my gosh, this is the pain I've been feeling. This is the wow. disconnect I've been feeling. I wasn't around my Palestinian family. I was barely around Arabs growing up. I grew up my entire life going to Shabbat every Friday. I would go to church every Sunday and we would practice with my dad and have Ramadan and we would have Eid. And that's when I would be with my Arab side of my family. And that's how we grew up. I realized through stories, again, like the same way that other people that have nothing to do with Palestine, they hear a story and they're able to relate. They're able to have empathy. Like Bella, to fear less. I've 
no fear when it comes to this. And I really believe that it's like what happens, happens. And what is going to happen is bigger than me. And if I lose every job, the reason why I did all of the work that I did was to get to this point. For Bella, speaking candidly about her own Palestine story, the story of who she is, came at a cost. I really do believe that if I started speaking about Palestine when I was 20, I wouldn't have Mm -hmm. gotten the recognition and the respect that I have now. I had so many companies stop working with me. I had friends that completely dropped me, like even friends that I had been having dinner with at their home on Friday nights for seven years, like now just won't let me at their house anymore. May 22nd, 2021, the New York Times published a full page ad paid for by a right wing American organization. The ad featured the faces of Bella, her sister Gigi, and pop star Dua Lipa over an image of a rocket strike covered in bold and inflammatory text. The intention was clear. The ad attempted to link the three women to terrorism, genocide, and anti-Semitism. In theory, like, that disregarded so many years of work and so many lives that have been lost and so much that has happened because they just undermined all of us to the leaders of a terrorist organization, it was really disappointing for me because we all really have taken time and money, subscriptions, to read something that we really felt was powerful, had integrity, and educational. And at this point, it was just, they sold their soul. And I think that was really, the word is disappointing. But the entire country of Israel, I mean, at Israel on Twitter, tweeted at me yeah and that's what's interesting is that when I speak about Palestine I get labeled as something that I'm not but I can speak about the same thing that's happening there happening somewhere else in the world and it's honorable so what's the difference so you told me recently a story that I'll let you speak to about a woman who angrily approached you in the city and how that one-on-one human connection of sharing truths and stories and holding space for someone whose worldview that's deeply ingrained in them is changing. Can you speak to that? So I was just leaving, eating lunch and this woman came up to me and she's like, you know, I just moved to New York um, from Israel recently and I told myself that I ever saw Bella Hadid in the street, I would walk up to her and ask why she hates me so much. And I looked at her and I was like, first of all, I want to hear you speak. I want to listen to everything you have to say, but I want to let you know, first and foremost, I do not hate you. I not only actually have a lot of respect for you coming up to me, which I don't think I would be able to do because, you know, it's an intimidating thing to do in the streets of New York City. But on top of it, like to be open to having a conversation with me I actually love you so I want to start out by saying that in general like I appreciate you coming to say something to me even though in my head that was the first time I felt wow am I can I do this like can I have an educated and emotional conversation with this person that has already a projected thought of what they think and know that I am Mm -hmm. and can I change their minds like anyways and I realized I can stand in my truth and speak from my heart You know, I heard her out why she genuinely, you know, she started to go to school here uptown. I won't say the school, but people were coming for her because she was Israeli and they were saying really, really horrible things to her. And I and I stopped her again there. I said, by the way, I want to remind you of something. Nobody ever, 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 ever should be spoken to like that. And you not only do not deserve that, but who do I have to go talk to to make them stop that? Because that is not okay. And that is not what we stand for, especially as Palestinians, because it's just not about you personally. It's not about me personally. What I said to her is the same way that I have my history, you have yours as well. You were taught things from a young age, and I'm not here to say that everything was wrong, but I do believe that there are in different contexts things that, you know, maybe you might have been taught that 
I'm sure that you will, will grow up to learn that are untrue. Because even in that conversation, she's like, wow, I there were so many things I've learned that even by having this conversation with you, I'm realizing are actually very untrue. I said to her, I said, you know, just the same way that Palestinians did not choose to be Palestinian, you did not choose to be Israeli. He's standing there as well as my boyfriend, and he is a son of a lineage of Holocaust survivors. And for him to chime in and say, well, you also have to understand that this is where I come from too. And this is not something that is about religion. It's something that is about people and undeserving treatment against them. And she ended up messaging us like later that day, this long, beautiful thing being like, wow, this, you know, it was a really moving conversation. And I also want her to know if she ever hears this, that like, if that was moving for her, it was healing for me. And I was so nervous. Like I said, I was, I'm not scared of anything. I, I was nervous that I wouldn't be able to combat whatever she had to say to me. But I realized in that conversation, it didn't never had to be combative. All it had to be was two girls talking about their history and hopefully finding a common denominator, which is we want nobody to die. How does it feel to share that? That was a story I kept with myself. And I think of sometimes and smile. And it keeps me able to speak through my heart and speak with emotion because I realize that speaking from your heart, you can never go wrong. And when I spoke to her about it, I realized that like nobody has to fight. It's not about your facts being the right facts or your story being the perfectly correct story because that's never how it's gonna happen. And if you go and tell somebody what you think your perfect story is, unfortunately, they've lived another life than you and they're gonna have a different story to tell. And if you start to say my story is the only story, then it disregards everybody else's stories. And that's not okay either. I only tell this, this story of me and this girl because of the fact that I hope other people will go out and do that for themselves as well. It's about being able to show the world and show other people that we all came from the same place. We're literally like, you know, and that's how I grew up is we're all brothers and sisters. That's how my dad literally raised me was that everybody from that part of the world, like we grew up coexisting. Mm. So, Isabella Khair Hadid, <laughs> what does it mean for you to rep your story today? And what do you hope that means for everyone who may be listening? Well, I have the chills. For me to rep my story today is like, for me to rep anybody else's stories that feels they can mirror me. And I just hope that the magnitude of this is bigger than what I could understand it to be. Because I do believe that even if it's just one, Palestinian speaking it's about personal stories of each of us and our families for other people to understand the common denominator about humans and their humanity independent of any conflict or side it's why when Bella uses social media to post about Palestinian life she says Please just in your head imagine if this was your father or if this was your sister or your brother or your son. People that are living in Palestine right now, they can't swipe away from what they're living through. 